There was a DEA officer, and he stopped at a ranch outside of Texas and was talking with the old rancher there. And he told the rancher, he said, I need to check your ranch for illegal drugs. And the rancher says, okay, but don't go in that field over there. And he points out the location. And the DEA officer gets mad and he says, Mister, I have the authority of the federal government with me. And he reaches into his back pocket and he pulls out his badge and his ID and he shows it to the rancher. And he says, see this badge? This badge means I am allowed to go wherever I wish on any land, no questions asked or answers given. Have I made myself clear? Do you understand? And the old rancher kind of shrugged and politely apologized and just continued working. Well, a short time later, the rancher hears some loud screaming and he sees the DEA officer running for his life, being chased by the rancher's big Santa Gertrudis bull. And those are big bulls. They probably stand up here on me. It's a big bull. And with every step, the bull is gaining on the DEA officer, and it seems likely that the bull is going to win this race. And the officer is clearly terrified. And the rancher throws down his tool, and he runs to the fence, and he yells at the top of his lungs. He says, your badge, show him your badge. <laughs> Are you content? Well, the Bible has something to say about being content. Surely one of the greatest causes of a believer not being content or having joy in their lives is a lack of contentment. And the Bible has something to say about that. In 1 Timothy, Chapter 6, verse 6, it says this. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. This is the truth. A truth. Why? Well, it says... Godliness with contentment is a great gain. Or you could substitute wealth or something valuable. This is what Paul is saying. But again, the question is, why is Paul saying this? Why is godliness with contentment wealth or something valuable? Well, he explains a little more in verse 7. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. It tells us we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. And truth, I, I've seen it. I mean, I've been there many times when they closed the casket, and there's not anything going out with that person that they didn't take bring into the, this world. I mean, no gold, no jewelry, no diamonds, no anything. Basically, the only difference that the person who is dead has that they didn't have when they were born is clothes on. So you can take nothing out of this world with you. And then Paul further explains in verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. See, verse 8 tells us why the previous verse, verses mean great gain. Food and clothing. 
literally covering equals contentment. Food and clothing or food and covering equals contentment. And really, that's all we need. Food, shelter, which means we have a choice. We can have contentment with what we have with God, food, shelter, or we could go another way, away from God's truth. But that means we won't have contentment. So we get contentment by the choices that we make or the choices we don't make. We do this by controlling how we respond to the circumstances around us, no matter how good or bad. We make the choice. We control how we react to circumstances. And therein is exactly what we are focusing on. The choices we make, the way that we walk equals contentment. But sadly, Christians and non-Christians fall after, follow after the world's lies about the secret of contentment. Never, it seems, have so many people wanted so much and found so little contentment once they have it. And that's hardly surprising because on a daily basis, we are bombarded with advertisements whose sole purpose of the ad advertisements is to breed discontent so that we will buy more things. We live in a time where we are one of the most prosperous nations on the face of the earth, but yet we still struggle with contentment. We live in a culture that is not content ever with little or with much. And it appears that the more things that people have, the more discontent they are. Typically, the richest people in the world are the most miserably unhappy. And Paul tells Timothy, we start with nothing, and we end with nothing. So contentment is not about the things that we accumulate. It is about living with satisfaction one day at a time. Well, this morning we're talking about how we can discover contentment in our lives. But we're not trained by our culture to be very content. Everything around us teaches us to believe that we need to accumulate things. A typical market, grocery market in the United States in 1976 stocked 9,000 items. Today, that same market carries over 30,000 different items. Item. And why is that? Because we have this compulsion to possess more and more things, thinking that they will bring satisfaction in our life. And that's what we're talking about the, here this morning, the drive for more and more and more, which becomes a lack of contentment. And God takes it very seriously. Now, why is that? Why is God concerned with our drive to accumulate more and more? One obvious reason is because it damages our priorities. 
Our priorities get out of whack when we fall in, it, when, we, when we chase after things that we want more than anything else. And it says, we'll see it in a few verses, that we fall into a trap. See, we run after the wrong things and we stop pursuing God. I mean, how many people do you know that work all the time and have no time for church, no time for worship, no time for God? Our priorities get out of whack. Stuff becomes the most important thing in our lives. Our priorities get rearranged. James said over in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. And James is right. Homicide is the second leading cause of death in the workplace. How many murders are committed by employees exacting revenge after being passed over for a promotion or being laid off or being fired? We read about it in the, in the news more often than, than we care to. And see, the drive for more and more damages our relationship. It's the preoccupation with things other people's things that are the cause of much of the crime in our society. People today are caught up in the, in the middle of, of a complete self-centeredness. The world revolves around them. They're so focused on getting what they want that it leads to unhappiness and unfulfillment. And so 1 Timothy 6 is telling us that the pursuit of all things at all costs causes unhappiness. Which leads us to another question. And it's the question of why. Why do we have this unhealthy drive for more? One reason is advertising. We are constantly bombarded with tricks to get more stuff. You turn on the television and there are commercials. You log on to the internet and it's full of ads. You drive down the highway and you see nothing but billboards. You open the mail and it's a catalog or an advertisement. You answer the phone and it's a telemarketer. The average American is exposed to 3,000 advertisements a day that promise happiness. If you just had that new exercise machine, you'd be ripped like the guy in the commercial. If you had those new golf clubs, you'd hit the ball like Tiger Woods. If you just had the right tan, or the right makeup, or the right clothes, and slowly but surely we are captured by the monster of more. And we're also susceptible to a lack of contentment because our self-esteem is, is so closely tied to the accumulation of possessions. See, we determine a person's worth by the amount of things they own, the number of cars, how big their house is, how many houses they have. If someone says, how much is he worth? We immediately reduce the answer to dollars and cents. 
See, our culture and its warped values have told us that we are less of a person if we don't accumulate things. And we buy into this. We have to have this car or these clothes because everyone else does. And everyone else is happy because they have those things. Well, guess what? They may have those things, but it doesn't mean that they are happy and content. How many of us want to be rich? Go ahead, raise, raise your hand. How many of you want to be rich? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> This, 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 of course, is a trick question, and sorry, I, I, <clears throat> I apologize for it. Why? Because in a moment, we'll see in verse 9. But, you know, I do think that everybody wants to be well off. Everybody wants to have money to do things. And we think if that means, means being rich, so be it. But here's the problem, verse 9. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's why I said it was a trick, a trick question. Temptation, which leads us to a trap along with foolish, harmful desire. I mean, how many rich people do you know that have died because of their riches, because they've been tempted to do things that ordinary people couldn't afford, couldn't afford to buy or do Or the amount of rich people that have died from drugs because it's been a temptation and it fell, it became a trap for them. So what's the solution? Well, there are three different directions, three different things that we need to see. And first and foremost is we need to open our eyes. We need to realize that stuff is never going to satisfy us. Happiness is not found in the accumulation of things. Uh, a bigger house or better cars, better stuff. See, in our soul, we know that things don't bring happiness. So how come we still look for fulfillment in those things? The, sec the, the first most toured house in the United States is the White House. But do you know what the second most toured house in the United States is? The second most toured house in the United States is in Memphis, Tennessee. It's the 23-room house of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Graceland is toured by hundreds of people every day. It, it's a combination of a home, amusement park, and a historic site. $15 million a year is brought in by those visiting and looking at the cars and airplanes and records. And few people in his time made as much money as quickly as Elvis did. And Certainly no one else had as much fame and popularity. And Elvis seemed to have it all. Money, airplanes, cars, mansions. But it's all stuff. It's just things. 
If you go 50 yards out the back of Graceland, you'll find a tombstone. August 16, 1977. At 42 years old, from an overdose of pills, suffering from depression, Elvis died. He was so drugged in the last days of his life that one time he passed out while he was alone eating soup and he nearly drowned when he fell asleep into the bowl of it. See, things did not do it for him. And, as, and, he, and though he had as much as anybody else, he said at one point, I would give a million dollars for one day of peace. So if you're caught up in coveting or lusting or driving for the accumulation of things, at some point we need to ask ourselves, why? Why are we trying to get it all? What do we think it will bring us? Why do we work 12-hour days to accumulate things? Mark's Gospel in Mark 8, verse 36 says, What good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? And what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And we need to wake up to that. We need to wake up and realize that nothing in this world is going to fulfill our desires. And it won't be in the gathering of things. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, A man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he has. Possessions do not make you happy, and we need to wake up to that. And not only do we need to open our eyes, but we need to share what we have with others. See, we're often very attached to our stuff, and the best way for us to get away from that is to let some of that stuff go. If we want contentment, we need to let things go. One of the byproducts of giving some of it away is it teaches us that we can get by on less. It teaches us that we don't need those things to be happy. By letting go of our money and, and some of our conveniences, we find that we don't need all of that junk to be happy. We can get by on less. And I think that's why Paul told Timothy in verse 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Paul says we must trust in God and we must be willing to let go of some of the stuff. Contentment comes when you're willing to give and willing to trust God. So if you want to be content, you need to start in the right place. And verse 10 breaks it down for us. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. For the love of money is a root. It doesn't say money is bad. It doesn't say money is good either. Money is immoral. It's neither good or nor bad. It can be used for good things. It can be used for bad things. But the love of money is the problem. And it's not that we have a material shape 
hole inside of us. It's that we have a God-shaped hole inside of us that only God can fill. See, the Apostle Paul tells us the secret to contentment in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. I don't say this out of deed, for I've learned to be content. There's that word, content, in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. See, the Bible is telling us the secret to contentment is to focus on Jesus Christ and to seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will take care of itself. But I got to tell you, that doesn't happen without a decision. We need to make a decision that I'm not buying into this material gain thing anymore. I don't need things to make me happy because they won't do it. And I will not serve things, but I will serve the Lord. I will focus on that which is most important. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sat down and thought about what's going to be the primary objective and focus of your life? What am I living life for? What are my goals? See, Paul, his joy came from the Lord. It's a gift, but it's also where Paul's focus was. We see, the, we see Paul tell the church, of which we're a part, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul wrote this when he was in prison in a damp, wet prison cell. And Paul didn't enjoy being in prison, but he knew of God's faithfulness, his love and his mercy and his power and his kindness. This is something that you can always be rejoicing over because that knowledge makes us rich. So how about you? How much contentment do you experience daily? Do you rejoice in him and who he is? Or have you bought into the myth that if I can obtain this or do this, then I will be happy and content? But the answer for contentment is found here. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So when Paul writes in verse 6, Godliness is a gain for us. It's because we can do everything through Christ which gives us strength. In Jesus, there are all the answers that you need. And in Jesus, that is the only place that you can find contentment. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 453. Would you please stand, number 453? Mm -hmm. 